So um, welcome back for the afternoon session. Um, so um, Professor Diamond will continue his lecture on sales conjecture for totally real fuel, please. Thank you. Um, so in, in the earlier lectures, I explained an, an algebraic version of uh, Sarah White conjecture for GL2 over totally real fields uh, in terms of Sarah weights and a notion of algebraic modularity, modularity, um, uh, modularity of weight sigma, where sigma was a it was an irreducible mod p representation of GL2 of a of, of the residue field or um, or more generally a product of residue fields at the primes over p in the in the totally real field. And I've started to discuss now a, a geometric variant, a, a geometric Sarah-Waite conjecture in terms of mod p Hilbert modular forms a la Katz. And um, so I explained, I, I went over the definition of mod p Hilbert modular forms in a geometric context. Um, using the using the, the Pappas Rappaport model to include the case where P is ramified in F, so we have a full uh, a full range of weights. So M K M um, will be the space of modular forms of weight K, and we're including another parameter um, which you can think of as, as twisting by. Uh, it, it's twisting by some torsion line bundle in a way that keeps track of the heck action. Um, and sufficiently small level U, which you can take to be principal level U, uh, le um, principal level N. And then we have the space of modular forms of, of weight Km level N with coefficients in F where F is a finite field. And we have a heck action on this space. And um, we'd like to be able to, well, we can associate Gawa representations to heck eigenforms in this space. And I sketched the proof of the, the existence of Gawa representations. Okay, so now we have uh, associated Gawa representations and we can try and formulate a, a conjecture um, about which weights. So given a mod P Galois representation, let's assume that it's modular. And we can ask, well, what weights, what are the weights of modular forms in this sense from which it arises? An advantage being now we can include weights that weren't covered in the original formulation. In particular, we can include um, weight one forms, parallel weight one forms, which have already been studied, and partial weight one forms as well. And I'll come to that at the end, but let me explain the general setup first. So um, so geometric modularity, I'm going to define a notion of being geometrically, well, it's obvious now, what does it mean to be geometrically modular of, of weight k comma m? And uh, we, so we say that rho is geometrically modular of a particular weight if it arises from a mod p Hecke eigenform of that weight and some level u prime to p. And then the question is, well, what is the set of weights for which rho is modular? And in the spirit of the algebraic Sarah weight conjecture, we expect some piatic Hodge theoretic characterization in terms of crystalline lifts. So this set should be determined by, maybe even is, the set of weights for which rho has a crystalline lift with the corresponding labeled Hodge Tate weights, this being the recipe for the labeled Hodge Tate weights of a characteristic zero of, of, a, of, a, of a piatic representation associated to a characteristic zero Hilbert modular eigenform with these weights under the assumption that K is pericious. 
Um, and we know that that is, in, is related to al being algebraically modular of a particular weight, where being algebraically modular of, of weight Km means, well, is equivalent to being algebraically modular of some Serre weight in the set of Jordan Holder factors of the representation associated, the algebraic representation associated to this, to this weight. Um, notice here, maybe I should point out a little difference, um, which is that uh, if, if P is ramified in F, then you have all the embeddings appearing here. So for example, if, if P is totally ramified, then you're taking in characteristic P uh, products of symmetric powers of the, the same standard representation, there's no twisting involved by Frobenius. Okay, so the turns out the naive conjecture is false. The, the one that I briefly speculated on that maybe the set of weights is the is what matches the the the, the um, possible labeled Hodge Tate weights of crystalline lists. And you can see that just by looking at what happens when you multiply by partial Hasse invariance. So we remember we have the partial Hasse invariance in this generality constructed by Rudy and Shao, um, but for uh, PN ramified constructed by Guan. Um, and these define hecta equivariant maps that shift the weight. So if you have an eigenform of, of weight K, then you have an eigenform, ignoring the M for the moment. If you have an eigenform of weight K, then you have an eigenform of, K, of weight K plus the weight of the Haas invariant. I'm using H theta for the weight of the Haas invariant, little h theta for the weight of the Haas invariant. So just to remind you briefly what those weights look like, um, if P is unramified, then they're of the form uh, zeros everywhere except a P followed by a one. And if P is ramified in F, then some of the weights of Hasse invariants have adjacent ones in the indices. Um, but just from the existence of this map, you see that modularity, uh, uh, some notation. Um, so I'm going to write, uh, you can define a partial, partial ordering using the weights of the Hasse invariants just by saying uh, that K is at most K prime. If the difference K prime minus K is a non-negative integer linear combination of partial Hasse invariants weights of partial Hasse invariance. So then if K is at most K prime in this sense of the um, um, partial ordering defined by weights of Hasse invariance, if rho is modular of weight K, then it has to be modular of weight K prime. And you see from that, that, that the naive conjecture can't be true because um, you have uh, you have rho which are algebraically mod uh, well yeah you have you have rho which are algebraically modular of weight k k comma m in in the sense that I just described having a, a Jordan Holder factor present among its hair weights but not algebraically modular of weight K prime, because shifting by weights of Hasse invariance can actually lose Jordan Holder factors from the reduction of the, from, from the algebraic representation. So um, you, you, you can't expect geometric and algebraic modularity to be equivalent in general. And since algebraic modularity, at least assuming the primary side conjecture is characterized by existence of crystalline lifts, that can't be true for, um, for geometric modularity. Um, and this, uh, you, you see the failure also outside the range of algebraic weights, you have, uh, you have 
partial you, you have weights of um, you have partial weight one forms that you get by multiplying by partial Hasse invariance for which there, there's, there's no crystalline lift, which you can uh, prove. Well, Bartlett gave examples um, using, um, by, by analyzing possible crystalline lifts in this situation using piatta Hodge theory. So, um, so what should be true? Well, you can use the notion of a, of a minimal weight, something that you see from the geometric perspective that you don't see, at least not clearly from the, from the algebraic stair weight pers perspective, is that there really is a notion of minimal weight as you see in, in the unramified case um, in, in Andrea Tagoran and in, in the ramified case in, in the Dimitra Visa and, and my paper with payment. There's this notion, there's a natural notion of minimal weight, um, which is just measuring how divisible a form is by partial Hasse invariance. So to get the minimal weight, just divide as much as possible by partial Hasse invariance. And, and you see that this is, this is, this is well-defined. The process has to stop because the partial Hasse invariants are, 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 um, are, are, are well-behaved. They're, they're, um, they meet every irreducible component. Um, but, so the divisors, the vanishing locus of the partial Hasse invariants um, are in fact, uh, um, are in fact uh, divisors, uh, smooth proper divisors on the Hilbert modular variety with normal crossings. Um, and they have no common, they have in particular, they have no common irreducible component. So this construction makes sense. You can divide as much as possible by these partial Hasse invariants and define the minimal weight of a modular form to be the resulting weight, the first weight, the lowest weight with respect to the partial ordering defined by partial Hasse invariants, um, the least weight, the first weight in which the Hecke Eigen system appears. Uh, maybe it's not obvious that um, that um, that that interpretation in terms of Hecke Eigen systems uh, is is true. Um, that if you have the same Hecke Eigen systems in different weights, then uh, then the only way it arises is by division by partial Hausdorff invariant. Um, but here's a definition of the minimal weight of a, of a Hilbert modular form, of a non-zero Hilbert modular form. So this is also sometimes called the filtration. The filtration of F would be this minimal weight. In the classical setting, this is, uh, I believe, what Sarah called it. So in the classical case, this is just a, these are just integers differing by p minus one, and you're, you're taking the, 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 the minimum. Okay, so it turns out that these minimal weights always lie in uh, in the minimal cone defined by these uh, inequalities. Uh, so remember the n thetas were the um, were the weights appearing were the were the, um, were the components appearing in the weights of the partial Hasse invariants? These are either p or one, according to whether. Uh, so maybe I should remind you a bit more that the that the that I'm uh, ordering. The embedding, so the thetas here are running through the set of embeddings of F. I'm assuming there's a unique prime over P for simplicity. Um, and order the embeddings uh, of the unramified, maximal unramified subextension um, 
in the natural way by, by uh, composition with Frobenius. And then for each extension of the embedding of the unramified subextension, arbitrarily choose an ordering of um, So for each embedding of the unramified subextension, arbitrarily choose an ordering of the extensions to an embedding of F or equivalently its completion. And that and the sigma appearing here is just the, the, the right shift with respect to that ordering. And the n thetas are either one or p according to whether um, according to whether theta is the first embedding in each uh, in each list. So in the unramified case, the n thetas are all p. If p is unramified enough, the n thetas are all p. If p is ramified enough, then one of the n thetas, the first n theta is P among each bunch of E extensions where E is the, the, um, the ramification degree. And the rest of the n thetas are one. Okay, so uh, maybe I should have drawn some pictures, but let me just give you, you should be able to picture some examples. If I just give you um, some, some, some basis elements for this cone. So um, in the, Unramified quadratic case, the cone is spanned by these vectors, 1p and p1. So notice that the, this, this forces non-negativity of, uh, of the x's. So this minimal cone is contained in the, the, the standard uh, non-negative cone. Uh, unramified cubic, this is the, the shape of the basis vectors. Um, in, the, in the ramified case, we're losing the, 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 the symmetry. We've chosen an ordering and the weights have to increase or uh, be non-decreasing with respect to the ordering. And you see these are the, 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 the basis elements. These span the cone and ramified cubic looks like this. And then the theorem uh, payment I proved is that the minimal weight uh, is always in this is always in this minimal cone. Um, and this was this was motivated uh, by uh, by wanting to formulate a, a, a geometric stair weight conjecture, and and looking at where these minimal weights uh, should lie, and um, and. This is sort of suggested by calculations involving theta cycles. And so this is the theorem that the minimal weights always, always lie in this minimal cone. So I'm not gonna say anything about the proof. Let me, let me um, go ahead and formulate the, the geometric stair weight conjecture. So suppose we're given a mod P irreducible Galois representation. This doesn't work well for reducible representations. Um, so suppose you're given a, an irreducible mod P Galois representation of, of GF, two-dimensional. Then there should be a unique minimal weight and not just in the minimal cone, but in the positive part of the minimal cone. So obvious notation here. And that minimal weight, oh, and so the, it depends on this parameter M, I'll come back to that. Um, and it should be characterized, well, first of all, uh, this K min should be the, the minimum, the unique minimum among all the weights in the minimal cone with respect to which row is geometrically modular. Maybe it's not obvious that there's a unique weight in the minimal cone. Um, but the, 
Um, but but there is a um, well. Let, let me come back to that point. So um, so here we're just looking at weights in the minimal cone. So if we want to characterize the weights with respect to which rho is modular, since minimal weights always lie in the minimal cone, we just need to characterize the, the, the weights in the minimal cone with respect to which rho is modular. So um, there should be, it should be governed by some minimal weight and that in turn, if you just restrict your weights in the minimal cone, you do have a piatic Hodge theoretic characterization of the weights for which rho is modular, geometrically modular. And so in terms of crystalline, having a crystalline lift with the correct labeled Hodge tate weights, namely m theta, m theta plus k theta minus one. So the difference should be k minus one, k theta minus one with respect to each embedding. Um, oh yeah, so this is what I was referring to before. So this equivalence here um, should hold for all, in fact, this, so the existence of a K uh, for which the existence of a K min such that one and two are equivalent it doesn't seem particularly um, particularly deep once you have once you know that minimal weights lie in the minimal cone, and in fact this equivalence should hold for all um, for all weights. So you can think of the set of weights, set of all weights from which rho arises, as being. Um, as being given by some minimal weight plus all the translates by non-negative integer linear combinations of the partial Hasse invariants. So a kind of Hasse cone, so everything within that, everything um, in this, uh, everything in the, in the in a, a Hasse cone cone spanned by Hasse invariants with the right congruence properties um, emanating from this minimal weight. And there's a, so remember the, the, the theorem about the minimal cone says that minimal weights lie in C min. Here's the, there's an extra, there's an additional um, Uh, expectation here that the minimal weight be, be positive and that we can prove um, at least if p is bigger than three. Um, in fact, uh, the, the obstruction is somehow only for p equal two and three and primes which are, uh, uh, well, primes over two and three which are totally ramified that, that cause a problem in the proof. Um, and if you forget about geometric modularity and just look at the equivalence between one and three, the fact that there is, or the conjecture that there is a, uh, a minimal K that governs whether a mod P representation has a crystalline lift with these labeled Hodge Tate weights. This is a purely piatic Hodge theoretic statement. It's a purely piatic Hodge theoretic conjecture, um, uh, which seems non trivial and not obvious a priori that one should expect this. And in fact, as I was saying before, this doesn't extend to, uh, to the set of all positive weights or even to the positive algebraic weights.
Okay, so this, this relates, uh, conjecturally relates geometric modularity to crystalline liftability with, these, with the corresponding weights. And we can also ask about the relation between being algebraically and geometrically modular of, of the same weight, whereby algebraically modular of this weight. So we have to assume now that K is at least, uh, the, the K thetas are all at least two in order to make sense of this notion of algebraic modularity, remember. And then algebraic modularity is equivalent to being modular of some ser weight among the Jordan Holder factors of the, of the corresponding algebraic representation, um, mod P. And the, this equivalent should only be within the minimal cone. And it's not hard to show that if, if, in fact, you see it from the construction, if you go back to, to the construction of the, the Galois representation is, uh, associated to uh, a geometrically, to a, to a geometric Hilbert modular eigenform, um, you see that it, it's, uh, it goes via um, lifting to characteristic zero, which implies algebraic modularity. So geometric modularity implies algebraic modularity, except you had to shift the weight by a lot. So being geometrically modular of some weight implies being algebraically modular of some weight. As for the other direction um, that algebraic implies geometric modularity, um, not only of some weight, but of the same weight, you would expect that to be true in, in, in general. This is somehow the easier direction that algebraic modularity implies geometric modularity um, of a particular weight. Um, and it's easy if, if, the, if the weight is pericious. Um, to go from geometric to algebraic, even if the weight is pericious, requires, um, it, it, it's, it's a question about lifting, being able to lift to characteristic zero then, and, uh, and, um, and I guess for sufficiently large parallel weight, you can do it using, using ampleness. Um, or maybe not even parallel, uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, but within the, within the cone of ample or at least conjecturally ample weights, you would expect this to be true. And you see in, uh, I think it's Emerton Reducey Child that this, the, this, um, this, this minimal cone is uh, maybe the closure of the conjecturally ample cone. So it, there's also some connection with being able to lift to characteristic zero um, in, this, in this minimal cone. Um, and right, so I was explaining the problem um, of geometric modularity of a particular weight implying algebraic modularity of a particular weight uh, is, 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 seems more difficult because, um, because the forms, you don't know, at least not yet, the, the, the forms of these weights would lift the characteristic zero, even if the weight is precious. Um, and a, a reason to expect this conjecture to be true. Well, if you if you believe the geometric sair weight conjecture, maybe you should turn it around and ask why should the geometric sair weight conjecture be true. Um, but there's 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 a the, the link between this and the geometric sair weight conjecture is that if you if you assume algebraic and geometric sair weight conjectures and the prime are conjecture, then then that implies this conjecture. Okay, so let me let me uh, come back to this um, 
to this parameter m, what's going on with this m? How does the minimal weight depend on, on m? So a few easy observations first. One is that, um, that the determinant of the associated Galois representation is determined by a, by a central character. Um, and, and that forces this relation between the determinant and, and the, and K plus two M. So the, you can think of this as saying that the cyclotomic character times the determinant of rho is the, um, is the mod P representation um, uh, associated to, to K plus two M, associated to the central character. And more explicitly, you see, this is a condition on, I'm assuming there's a unique prime over P. So this is just a condition um, on, these, uh, on these Ks and Ms on K plus two M, the components of K plus two M and I'm missing, I'm missing a factor. There should be a P to the I, there should be a factor of P to the I. Um, which you see here. So, so M determines the sum of the K, I, J, P to the I's mod P to the F minus one. Remember omega has order P to the F minus one. And the, um, if you fix a, a tau I and look at the theta I, J is extending it, these all have the same reduction. I'm looking at the same fundamental character for all those omega thetas. So omega theta or omega tau i, if you like, appears um, with coefficient sum of the kijs. Um, and they're related by, by composition with Frobenius. So there's a factor of p to the i here. And as I said, omega has order p to the f minus one. So m determines this, uh, the, sum of the k, i, j, p to the i's mod p to the f minus one. And in fact, you can think of this as m determining k, well, m and rho. So rho and m determine k modulo, um, so the, the, this condition um, the condition that this be zero mod p to the f minus one is equivalent to the corresponding weight being an integer linear combination of partial Haas invariants. This is a lattice inside the, the, the lattice of all weights. Maybe you should think of this as in terms of, in terms of uh, the character group of the torus. Um, um, so the, the restriction of scalars from F to Q or OF to Z of GM. Um, so that character group um, is Z to the sigma. And if you, if, if you look at the, so this lambda is the kernel of taking the character and, and, um, and reducing them up here, evaluating on, on, on uh, FP points. And if M and M prime are, are equivalent mod lambda, so if M and M prime differ by an integer linear combination of partial Haas invariants, then, then, these, then the corresponding spaces of modular forms are actually, uh, are actually isomorphic uh, Hectaequivariant isomorphic. Um, so this the, these spaces really only depend on on m mod lambda, and so the corresponding Galois representations only depend on m mod lambda. 
And this is all well behaved under twisting. If you twist by a character, then uh, the corresponding weights will be shifted in this second uh, coordinate in the M parameter by, by, the, by B. Okay, so this was, uh, this, this is fairly easy. What's more interesting though is what happens if you fix the Galois representation and, and vary, vary the M. And you should think of this uh, as, as some, as an interpretation of a theta cycle. Um, and in fact, I, uh, I think it's kind of a, a misconception or a red herring to think of a theta cycle as twisting the Galois representation by powers of the cyclotomic character in the classical setting. You really want to think of the Galois representation as being fixed. And, and, um, and the, the theta operator is really twisting the, the, twisting the line bundle. It's, it's altering the weight, but fixing the Galois representation. And you see that better from the point of view of partial, partial theta operators um, as, uh, as defined in, in, by Andreata and Goren and, and, and generalized um, to the ramified setting. So let me uh, state, so these are, so with, with Sasaki, we looked at the, uh, um, the construction of theta operators of, of, of uh, Andreata and Goren and, and um, simplified it some. And there, Dimitrov and Visa looked at the, these partial theta operators in the ramified case. And uh, you, here's a sort of optimal, optimal theta operator. Um, in the ramified setting as well, you can think of the theta operator as a Hecke equivariant map from weight k comma m to weight k prime comma m prime, where the weight shift is, is given here. So notice that m drops by, oh, maybe I should point out that, that the theta operators are indexed by embeddings of the, the by the tau i's, by the, uh, embeddings of the unramified subextension or of the residue field. So they are F, they are F partial theta operators. And the weight shift is by the weight of the, in the K component, is by the weight of the partial Haas invariant, the, the top partial Haas invariant. So in the ramified case, that's uh, one comma minus one. And um, well, plus two in the in the theta direction, and the m drops by one in the theta direction, and the the two and the minus one here are coming from Kodaira Spencer, coming from a Kodaira Spencer um, homomorphism, and. The additional H theta here, uh, I'll, I'll come back to the construction in a moment, but the, the additional H theta here is a multiplication by a partial Hasse invariant in order to ensure that the form is, 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 uh, is entire, is holomorphic. And the, uh, the image of, of F under the theta operator is divisible by a partial Hasse invariant if and only if either the original F is or the weight is divisible by P. So this is a, a generalization of the, um, of a phenomenon mentioned in the, in the classical setting and, and generalized to the um, unramified case by Andrea and Goren. And this is in the ramified, this applies in the ramified case as well. So I, I, ju I just put this on, on the archive.
And notice what's happening with the weights in the ramified cases. That the shift is by by one comma one in the um, in the final two uh, thetas corresponding to or it's extending the the given talk in the ramified case. And it's P comma one, where the P is the index of the preceding embedding in the unramified case. And the, the, the idea um, is based on the, the one and under that term Goren. Um, which in turn is, is, is generalized in Katz's construction. I think they credit uh, Gross for this interpretation of the construction, the definition of data operators in the classical case. Um, maybe Udi knows. So yeah. the, the uh, so the idea is you have these tautological sections of these um, of these uh, of these uh, line bundles that are the, the factors of the automorphic line bundle. You have tautological sections over the Igusa cover at level um, uh, Gothic P. The prime over the prime over p, and you can divide by the appropriate power to get a rational function on the Agusa cover, which you can then differentiate, and you apply Kodaira Spencer, and then multiply back by the product of partial Hasse invariants, or I call these fundamental Hasse invariants by the product of these fundamental Hasse invariants as well as the additional um, H theta to get to, to, to eliminate poles that were introduced in the process. Um, and so a priori, this is, the, this, um, this is a form on the pullback to the Agusa cover, but the, the, it, the, it descends. to the Hilbert modular variety at level prime to P. The resulting form descends and, and is, is holomorphic. And the construction is hepta equivariant. And you can also characterize the kernel in terms of the image of, of a partial Frobenius operator. Um, and, and in particular, if, you, if you're given an eigen, if, you, if rho is, is modular of some weight, then you can always ensure that the eigenform is not in the kernel of theta. And so apply theta um, to deduce that if rho is modular of weight k comma m, then when you shift m, so if you apply theta, you shift m and you increase the weight by at most this much. So the result could be uh, divisible by Hasse invariance, and in fact is divisible by a partial Hasse invariant if P divides K theta. And so there's a, there's a drop that should be K here, not K prime. So you see a, a drop in the theta cycle. So think of um, think of these values of k, where the minimal values of k, as you apply the theta operators, as you vary the m, as being the theta cycle, and you see this behavior that the that the weight increases by at most 
this much. The weight of a partial Haas invariant plus twice the um, plus two in the theta component. And uh, you do even better, or there's a drop in the minimal weight in, in the theta cycle when the weight component at theta is divisible by p. And how am I doing on time? So now I'm gonna spend the rest of the time talking about partial weight one, which is somehow the, the, the motivating question was somehow the motivating question in the first place is how do you characterize um, the, uh, the Galois representations that should come from partial weight one forms in characteristic P geometrically defined. Um, so the case of parallel weight one, as I mentioned, has already been, uh, I can't remember if I mentioned, it's already been, been studied. Um, and the, the expectation, the natural expectation, generalizing the, the classical uh, case considered by Eidic 7, is that rho is geometrically modular of parallel weight one if and only if rho is unramified at, if you're allowing multiple times over p, all times over p. And uh, one direction so that representations arising from parallel weight one modular forms are unramified at the primes over p um, is, was proved by Dimitrov and Visa. Um, and uh, I think it may be assuming P is inert by Emmett and Rubitsi and Chow independently. Um, the other direction that unramified representations arise from classical, not, not classical, arise from parallel, parallel weight one forms is proved under some technical hypotheses on the representation by G and Kasai. Okay, so that's parallel weight one, but what about partial weight one? So, uh, so first of all, the more the most immediate um, generalization of this um, would would be where you have more than one prime, where you have more than one prime over p, and then the expectation, or a special case of the conjecture. Uh, notice, uh, maybe I should point out that the that parallel weight one. Um, would have to be minimal. There's nothing in the minimal cone that's below parallel weight one, at least not in a positive minimal cone. Um, right, so as I was saying, the, the most, uh, um, direct generalization, if you have more than one prime over P, then the expectation is that rho is unramified at that, at, at, a, at a chosen prime frac P, if and, on, if and only if rho is geometrically modular of some weight of this form where all the K, all the K thetas are, are one for the thetas that correspond to, um, um, so the thetas that, that induce um, the, the frac p yodic metric on, on f. So the thetas in sigma p, when you decompose, so choosing embeddings of q bar into q. Well, maybe you just think of everything as, as uh, yeah, I think just work over qp bar. So then you have a, a decomposition of, of Embedding well, yeah. I guess you need to choose embedding of q bar into q p bar. So then the embeddings sigma of f into q bar, remember, decompose uh, according to the primes over p. And if all the k thetas are one for the thetas 
for that associated to that particular prime, that should be that should imply that the representation is unramified at p. And conversely, if the representation is unramified at p, then uh, the local representation at p has a crystalline lift with labeled Hodge tight weights all zero. And so you would expect it to be geometrically modular. So I, I, I stated the conjecture for simplicity in the case where there's a unique prime over p, but it, it factors in, in, the, in, in the obvious way, in the natural way, so that this becomes the ex expectation. If you have more than one prime over p, its minimal weight should have, should have this shape. You should have k theta equal one for the, all the thetas in sigma p, but some other stuff at other, for the thetas in, um, in sigma p prime for p prime not equal to p, depending on the local behavior at the local behavior of rho at those primes. Um, and under the assumption that k is pericious, this, this direction that, that modularity of, of, of such a weight implies that the representation is unramified p is, is proved uh, under some hypotheses by, by Deo, Dimitrov, and Pisa, including periciousness of the weight. And, um, and in this generality by Demaria. Again, pericious. Okay, well, next, what about, uh, what about partial weight one where the, the partial is really at, uh, where the, the, the partiality, um, is that a word? It involves embeddings at a, at a particular, the embeddings in, in, a, in, a, in sigma p Let's go back to the case where, where there's a unique prime over P. So suppose there's a unique prime over P and you have, uh, when should you expect to have partial weight one, um, but not parallel weight one? So let's start with the simplest case. So the rest of the, rest of the talk is, is joint as, as was most of, the, um, most of what I said earlier, joint with Sasaki. So suppose first P is inert and we're in the ramified, uh, sorry, not ramified, we're in the quadratic case. So quadratic inert case. I'll come back to the ramified case. So in the quadratic inert case, um, well, what are the possible values of K? What are the possible weights in the minimal cone, which are partial weight one? And being in the minimal cone forces K, so uh, let's, let's exchange uh, K, uh, exchange the embeddings if necessary so that we have a one in the zero width place. And you've got K one in the first place. And that K one is at most P in order to be in the minimal cone. And I've, I've already talked about parallel weight one. Um, so let's assume that K one is between two and P. And in fact, for simplicity, um, assume K one is not two. A lot of what I say, um, works also for K1 equal two, but there's some complications. And let's first figure out when rho has a crystalline lift with the corresponding labeled Hodge state weights, namely zeros correspond, all zeros corresponding to one of the embeddings and zero and K minus one or K1 minus one at the other embedding. So this, this has nothing to do with being unramified. Um, so, well, the local representation might be reducible or it might be irreducible. Let's first look at the case where it's reducible, where at least in the, in the Fontaine Lafay range, where you can immediately see that if the representation is reducible, then it has to have this shape. It has to be an extension uh, of trivial by a character whose restriction to inertia is a small power of, well, the K1 minus first power of the corresponding fundamental character. So this is the, um, so this would be omega corresponding to tall one 
raised to the k1 minus first power. Um, so for, uh, but I've, yeah. And omega one is omega zero to the p. Where the zero and the one are indexing the embedding, not the, not the NEVO of the fundamental factor. Well, if you write the p-adic expansion in the, in the desired form, a0 plus a1p in the, in the context of, of, of um, algebraic zero weight conjectures, you see that a0 is p and a1 is k minus two. And this is the case that I, I um, was, was working out explicitly, I uh, forget which lecture. Um, and this is exactly the case where the, these two lines in the space of extensions coincide. Um, and it turns out this distinguished line also determines whether rho has a crystalline lift um, which corresponds to partial weight one. So having a crystalline lift corresponding to this partial weight one turns out to be equivalent to the extension class if the representation is reducible, turns out to be equivalent to the extension class being in this distinguished line, which is uh, when you have three Sayer weights. Um, you, you, and you can interpret this in terms of, of ramification. There's a sense in which this is, is uh, I forgot the terminology we use uh, in, in the paper with Mendele and Roberts, but it's somehow even less than Perrangier in terms of vanishing on, on, uh, on, um, on ramification subgroups of the absolute, uh, of the inertia group. Um, and uh, as I said, it has three algebraic, at least three algebraic weights. Turns out one of them is not gonna play a role, but two of them do play a role. And these are the two, um, the two sets of labeled Hodge Tate weights. I'm, I'm, so this is labeled Hodge Tate weights zero and P for the embedding tau zero and zero K one minus two for the embedding tau one. And um, so this is somehow the ordinary weight, the, the, the obvious weight that you would expect. This is an additional weight coming from the extension class being in this in this line inside the two-dimensional space of extensions. And in fact, the, the, the converse holds um, that um, if, if you just analyze the possibilities, if rho has a crystalline lift, if rho is reducible and has a crystalline lift with these labeled Hodge Tate weights then it has a crystalline lift with the labeled Hodge Tate weights corresponding to partial weight one. So there's an equivalence, which in fact extends to the irreducible case for this choice for these two weights. So um, having a crystalline lift with these labeled Hodge Tate weights is equivalent to having a crystalline lift with these labeled Hodge Tate weights. So, how is this manifested in terms of geometric modularity? Well, you see the same phenomenon if you, if you mess around with Hausen variance and, 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 and theta operators. So if rho is modular of partial weight one in the sense, then multiplying by a partial Hausen variant gets you to this weight, which was the one corresponding to that first um, set of labeled Hodge Tate weights. On the other hand, applying a theta operator gets you to that other weight. So being geometrically modular of this partial weight one implies geometric modularity of these two weights. And well, what about the converse? Um, so suppose rho is geometrically modular of these two weights. apply a partial theta operator to the form giving rise to the first of these weights. And what you find is the weight of the second of these forms shifted 
by a partial Haas invariant. And if you're careful, you can even uh, show that these forms have to be the same. So theta one, uh, well, you can choose the forms to end up with the same one by, by, um, by choosing suitably normalized eigenforms. And I guess also using that the form, uh, the F double prime is non-ordinary, has to be non-ordinary. So applying theta to F prime, you end up with something divisible by partial Haas invariant. But uh, in this case, it's, it's Andrea Tagorin that tells you that therefore F prime has to be divisible by that partial Haas invariant because the weight K1 minus one was not divisible by P. And so it follows that rho is modular of weight Uh, but the original F prime is divisible by a partial Haas invariant. So you can get down from weight P plus one comma K one minus one to weight one comma K one. So um, if I can just take another few minutes. So if, if we assume the algebraic stair weight conjecture and the equivalence between algebraic and geometric modularity, then we get that being geometrically modular of this partial weight one is equivalent to rho having a crystalline lift, partial weight one. But with these labeled hodge state weights corresponding to partial weight one. Uh, I've messed up my indices here. So we had geometric modularity of partial weight one being equivalent to geometric modularity of these two algebraic weights and existence of crystalline lifts being equivalent to crystalline liftability for these two algebraic weights. Then by the results on, and they're even ser weights, the so weights are small. So we know the equivalence between um, uh, crystalline liftability and algebraic modularity. So if we also assume the equivalence uh, between uh, algebraic and geometric modularity, we get, this, we get this equivalence. But one direction is easy for pericious weights. And we know um, the algebraic Sarah weight conjecture, at least under some mild hypotheses, and you can use the ad hoc arguments uh, to treat the cases when they fail. So let me just state the theorem that I've just sketched the proof of, um, which is that if rho is modular, so this is just one direction of the equivalence, if rho is modular and has a crystalline lift corresponding to partial weight one, then rho is geometrically modular of partial weight one. And the same argument works in the ramified case, um, except that you have to use this, uh, the, this finer theta operator and where you had, P, this was P plus one in the, in the unramified case, in the ramified case, you have twos here. Okay, I've run over, so I better stop and see if there are questions. Yeah, okay. Um... Thank you. So, other questions or comments? Uh, yeah. I'd like, uh, first of all, to thank uh, Professor Diamond for uh, his. Uh, course on behalf of organizers and uh, participants. Thank you very much once more. It was a great pleasure to follow your lectures. Thank can you. I ask a quick question? Sorry, I, I'm on a phone and I'm a little bit outside my office, but I hope you can hear me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, so I was watching your lecture off and on. Uh, usually these kinds of theorems that comes from a weight point form somewhere, you have some finiteness condition or inertia. Are these not there anymore in these kinds of theorems, going back to Buzzard-Taylor and Buzzard's 
people in the jams and etc. Um, um, is is finite this on inertia there or not there? No, it, it's 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 not there. This partial weight one, um, yeah. uh, the crystalline representations, um, the image of inertia is infinite. Okay, because of the one k thing. Yes. Okay, thank you. And uh, local global compatibility seems not, at uh, primes over p seems, seems not to be known in characteristic zero in this setting, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. I encourage people to try to <laughs> sort that out. Looks very interesting, thank you. Okay, so can I ask one question? Um, so in this uh, case, um, in the theorem, so so how many cell weights we get? So four, or how many? Um, cell so weights? in the unramified, so in the unramified case, mm -hmm. um, there are three weights. There are three stair weights. Three stair weights. Okay. Three stair weights, unless the representation uh, splits. If the local representation actually splits, then you'll have, uh, then you'll have four stair weights. Also, okay. Um, um, there might be some pathological case where you only have three or something like that, but I think yeah. typically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So for the certainly for non-split representations of this form. You will, in the unramified case, you will have three stair weights. In the ramified case, uh, ramified quadratic case, I believe it's also three non split, it's also going to be three stair weights. Also, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Thank you. Um, in the ramified case, right, we have the twos here. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see sim. Uh, I assume k was at least three, you're gonna see sin k minus three and sin k minus one uh, twisted. Mm -hmm. Right. By the inverse of the determinant. And one other, <laughs> which, uh, yeah, which I'm not gonna to try to work out in my head. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So well, let's um, let's thank Professor Dynam uh, again, and we will uh, resume uh, in about twenty minutes, right? Yeah. Yes. Thank you.